thank you all for joining us for our precision spraying webinar. So I'd like to introduce our speakers briefly. Today we're, we're joined by uh, a nice panel. We have Dr. Jason DeVoe, who's with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs as a spray application specialist. And he's going to start by covering an introduction to precision spraying principles and the use of rate controllers. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Herping Ju, who is an agricultural engineer with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Worcester, Ohio. And he's going to give us an overview of the Smart Apply Spray System and some of the field testing that they've done with that system. And then we'll hear from Steve Boer, who is the CEO and founder of Smart Guided Systems. And he'll talk about how that technology has been commercialized. And then again, we'll go into a Q&A session with all three of our presenters. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our first speaker, Jason DeVoe. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to everyone that took the time to show up for another Zoom meeting. Um, these are never easy, but we're gonna do our best to, to be informative and entertaining. And again, thank you for taking the time and thanks for having me. Uh, Michael wanted me to talk about in precision in orchard applications. And then he told me, and by the way, you're gonna be followed up by Steve and Herping, which is you know, terrifying given that Herping's been in the space of precision spraying for longer than I've been in this job. Um, Herping was generous enough to have me visit him in Ohio probably the first six months I was in this position about 12 years ago. And uh, I continue to be in awe of him. So how's that for pressure, Herping? We're gonna talk about improving the precision of air assist in orchard spraying. And I'll tell you a little about me. I was a bench scientist. I studied plant cell electrophysiology in university for way too many years. So this uh, agriculture wasn't my thing, but OMAFRA, the Ministry of Agriculture in Ontario was pretty desperate. So they took a shot on a guy that wasn't an engineer, at least not in the conventional sense. And I've been in this role ever since. Um, long after these talks are done, if anyone's interested in learning more about application technology in, in agriculture, uh, I encourage you to go to Sprayers 101, which is a site I administer with Dr. Tom Wolf, and it's everything you never wanted to know about spraying. It's all free, and we encourage you to go use that site. Uh, I should also mention that I'm the author of a resource called Air Blast 101, which grew somewhat organically over the last 10 years. Uh, and while we've all been on lockdown for the last four or five months, I've been working with a number of authors to come out with the second edition, which I'm really happy to say is getting near the end. Uh, I'm excited to see it published. Uh, that guy is Mark Lederborough. He's the guy I'm doing most of the work with as I stare dreamily at him here. And uh, he's another nozzle head out of Michigan. We spend two or three hours every morning on Skype making that book happen. So some of this presentation is definitely attributed to Mark. So let's talk about four different ways you can improve the precision of your orchard sprayer. You don't need to run out necessarily, sorry guys, and buy a brand new sprayer. There's a lot you can do with your existing systems. And the reason I have a job right now is because I don't get to tell you three things and then you run off and do them. This collage is just a, a small cross section of all the design variability in sprayers. And honestly, when you're trying to improve precision, when you're trying to improve the accuracy of what it is you want to achieve, sometimes the best advice for one sprayer is absolutely the wrong thing for another sprayer. So to do this correctly, I'd have to ask some questions like, tell me about your orchard, tell me about your sprayer, tell me what you're trying to apply. So it can get pretty specific, but we'll do our best. Of four precision improvements, the first and easiest one you can do is to match the vertical flow distribution to the canopy. And before your eyes cross, it's as simple as this. Everything that's red, you don't need. That's it. Matching vertical distribution means matching the spray that's coming out of your sprayer to the height of your target. Now, if you're doing something like a dormant oil or a, a trunk spray, then that's your target. There's no need to spray the ground. There's no need to spray it up into the air. If you're after just the canopy, that's where your targeting should be. An unadjusted sprayer produces highly variable coverage. You'll drench some spots, you'll miss others entirely, and it wastes a phenomenal amount of spray. Now in this case, 
the red is hitting the ground, the red is going straight up into the air, and the red is blowing through the target, past the intended target. All of that is spray that could be working for you, and it isn't. Uh, that little pound the plume logo in the bottom, mm -hmm. I worked with Gail Amos out of Washington State a number of years ago. He was frustrated and looking for a way to encourage people to think differently about their spraying, and we came up with a rather aggressive logo. It was fun for a while. Part of adjusting your vertical is to be able to see air. Um, I mean, they're air assist sprayers. There's a reason we use air. Air is almost a, a surrogate carrier for the spray, I'm sorry, for the active rather than volume. Additional water will give you good coverage, but honestly, 90% of the battle is how you adjust and aim your air. And we can't see air, so we have to try to see air. And a really old school way to do that is with lengths of ribbon. Now, in this case, this is Madeline Waring shot out of British Columbia. I went out there for a few weeks and we worked together to do this. Uh, these ribbons are way too long. Uh, what happens is the wind picks up, they stretch, they get sucked into the intake of the fan and blown out all over the place like confetti, which is entertaining, but it, it's not terribly informative. So if I had this picture to do over, I would reduce this to uh, 25 centimeters or 10 inch ribbons. That's all you need. And what you do is you tie them to the air outlet on your sprayer, whatever your design, and you park it in your orchard and you extrapolate. Wherever the ribbons are pointing is more or less where the air is going to vector. And if it's vectoring over or under your canopy, not only don't you need that air, but you don't need the nozzles in those regions either. Uh, we could get into the nitty gritty of the angle of the nozzle and how droplets fall and how difficult it is to get to the top of certain targets, but those are rather nuanced and it's a bit more than I wanna do here in this talk. Suffice to say, standing behind a sprayer and looking at this is very informative. Now, if you don't like what you see, uh, obviously beyond turning off nozzles, how do you control the air? Well, in this case, you'll note there are deflectors, two at the top and two at the bottom. These are, I would say, minimal. Uh, these are pretty flat. They are at least, they have sidewalls on them, which helps to channel and focus air energy. I would like to see the top ones considerably longer and larger but uh, it's nice to see them there nonetheless. And you can, with this low profile radial, actually change the skew and direction of the air by adjusting them, focusing all the air and spray into the crop. We can continue to use ribbons, which by the way are just flagging tape, possibly the cheapest investment you can make for your operation and one of the most telling. Uh, next thing you do is you tie the ribbons in the canopy itself. You'll need a partner for this. One person will drive by with the air on, and the other person will stand on the far side of the upwind target. That's important to note that because that's usually the hardest target to hit. We're spraying into the wind, we wanna see if the spray is getting there. Interpreting the ribbons can be a little tea leafy, if that's a term. We always want the top ribbon to move. That's the hardest place to hit with any sprayer, whether it's a tower or an axial. And that's because that's when wind is the highest, way up high in the orchard. It's generally the furthest that air and spray has to travel to get to the target. And uh, it's quite often where we have a lot of disease and insect problems because it is such a difficult target to hit. So we always wanna see that wiggling. Uh, even if you're using a tower sprayer on uneven ground, if it rocks laterally, you still you have an opportunity for that to miss the top as it occasionally aims too far down. So knowing all that, we always wanna vector our air slightly higher than the target. Now, the absolute bottom ribbon, eh, don't get too bent out of shape about that one. Uh, generally speaking, spray tends to fall. If that one doesn't move a whole lot, that's not a big problem. And the middle ribbon can be a little tricky to interpret as well. Consider that our objective here is to displace stale, stagnant air in a canopy with spray-laden air. And if you've achieved that, that should mean that the air should only just move the ribbon. If you look to the right, you'll get a sort of a generic idea of how the ribbon should move. If they stand 90 degrees straight out, you're probably slipstreaming. You're overblowing your target. That is to say, a lot of your spray is going beyond where you want it to go. 60%, it might be too far, it might not. 30% is sort of a waft. It just fluffs briefly as the sprayer drives by. If you can get the ribbon to do that, you've achieved your goal. If it doesn't move at all, as I say, it's, it's not necessarily the end of the world. It might mean that the air and spray only got into the target and didn't come out the far end, which would be great if you could manage to do that all the time. 
It just means you need to look a little closer. So this is the simplest way to assess where the air and spray in your sprayer is aimed and whether or not you're achieving your goal of getting it into the target. And as simple as this is, it is a form of precision. I'll move on. Another improvement you can do is to match the horizontal distribution to canopy spacing. So we got it to the top and the bottom and we got it in. Now let's look at it this way. Unless you're spraying a fruit wall, which you might be, uh, there's a lot of gaps, a lot of places where there isn't a target. And this is certainly not new, first introduced in the 80s uh, from what I've gathered from ag engineers. This happens to be a Gillison's aftermarket. This is an ultrasonic tree detection system. And uh, there's all kinds of legend and lore about FMC and John Bean and how these sensors were developed. But essentially, these are sonic, think of them as uh, sonar on a sub. They're bouncing a signal at the front of the sprayer off a canopy. They detect that there is or is not a canopy, and that goes into an algorithm that uh, decides whether or not to turn the sprayers, the, the boom, on or off. So to the right, you can see the, the disks, those are the sensors. To the bottom left of this image, you'll see three uh, electrical shutoffs, or solenoids, I mean. And what they've done is they've broken that boom up into three sections. Uh, and in the top left, you see the control box with zones one through six. This means as the sprayer drives along, it turns sections of the boom on or off, corresponding with whether or not there's a canopy. As I say, this, is, uh, this isn't new, and it certainly had its difficulty in development. In, in early years, the sensors would go all wonky, they'd be covered in fungicides, they didn't read correctly. Uh, manufacturers used to say, hey, if you invest in this and it fails, don't worry. Uh, the worst that happens is your boom stays on, and it's just a normal air blast sprayer again which I didn't think was a great marketing move, but um, that was for them the worst case scenario. It, it did get better over time. So this is me parked, scaring the hell out of an operator because he's wondering, why is there a guy parked on the other side of the road with a camera aimed at me? But uh, I thought this would be a great opportunity to take a photo to show you the opportunity for savings. Very much like a recirculating or a recycling sprayer, you get most of those savings in young canopies and early season applications. This boom, if it had the equipment I just showed you, would turn on and off between the targets. And it's estimated at about 25% savings over the season. Um, there are proponents for this technology. You don't see it as much as we used to because we're moving to more densified orchards. Uh, but there's been debate about the lead and the lag. You want the boom to turn on a little ahead of your target because we want some of the eddies, the turbulent eddies between the trees to carry the spray into the edges of the target. Uh, there are some that say the top should never be turned off. The top section should always be on because we, we de so desperately need spray at the top of the canopy and that it's the bottom sections that should be fluttering on and off. But as I say, this is another form of precision. Uh, it's still viable. It's still out there. Precision improvement number three. This is a little trickier, holding the rate constant by matching flow to travel speed. And this really plays into what Michael wanted, and that's a talk on... Uh, uh, controllers. Rate controllers do simply this. They maintain a constant application rate by altering flow relative to travel speed using pressure. Uh, I labored over the definition and as I say it does cross eyes but all it means is if you speed up or slow down in an orchard and you're spraying at a constant rate that means that the trees that happen to be there at the time may get more or less of a dose than you intended. Here's a common example. Uh, here we have a, a tower sprayer. As it's traveling uphill on the right, you see a very short red arrow that indicates a vector and a speed. As you're going uphill, particularly with PTO drawn tractors, uh, sprayers, your dwell time increases. That means you're, you go slower. The sprayer is focused on trees longer. And you can increase your rate up to 20%. And then when you crest the hill and start going downhill, you tend to speed up. Again, now you're zooming past the trees faster than you'd intended, and you can actually drop your rate by 20%. And Mark always tells this joke that, uh, he says it's a joke, I laugh, I'm polite, that if we always seem to think that insects need more killing going uphill, and they're easier to kill going downhill. Uh, if you believe that, you probably don't need a rate controller. Otherwise, you might consider the variability in the coverage without one. So. 
if you're thinking, eh, you know, I've always gotten away with this, I, it's never really been a problem with me, well, consider the benefits of what a rate controller can do for you. It can reduce higher residue on the uphill. Even if you don't mind a little extra volume moving uphill, that, that's more product that ends up in the trees and probably more than you want. It'll certainly improve crop protection on the downhill because it'll keep your rate where it's supposed to be, no sublethal dosing. Experience has shown that when you improve coverage uniformity, no gaps, no drenches, operators can safely spray at minimal rates. And I'm, I'm playing into Herping's wheelhouse here. Um, if you're wondering how that works, understand that labels are a one-size-fit-all proposition. Agrochemical companies and registrants are usually the same thing, and regulatory bodies will put labels together assuming that they're meant to work for everybody. Maybe you're not the greatest sprayer operator in the world. Maybe your equipment could use a refresh. Maybe you, you meant to prune and hedge and never got around to it. Well, that pesticide rate should still work for you. Um, that's why they are what they are, these minimal effective doses. So if you're very accurate with your application, if every drop counts, then you can tend to operate safely at the bottom of a range. Uh, that's been shown time and again. So these are some of the things that rate controllers can do for you. So what are they? Uh, this collage has a console, which is generally where the operator will monitor what's going on and calibrate the equipment. Uh, in order for them to work correctly, of course, the system has to know how fast you're going. And uh, the inset in the top left is a GPS speed sensor. sensor. At the bottom is a, is a variation, an alternative. That's a radar-based speed sensor. And the difference is, the GPS will pick up from satellites, it's very effective, but not if you're in an, uh, an orchard that's really dense. You often have a hard time getting a signal. So a lot of guys will opt for the radar-based speed sensor. You've got to find somewhere on the chassis to mount it. Um, there have been complaints in the past of high grass throwing them off, but they're generally very reliable. Either system will, will give you a, a, an accurate speed reading. And then we've got a flow control valve, depending on your make and your model, if uh, the sprayer feels that you need more flow, then it will alter the valve to uh, divert more spray to the boom. If you need less flow, it'll divert it to the bypass or the overflow. And then you've got a flow meter in some cases, which is telling the computer how much flow is actually uh, going by. So those are kind of the components. Um, these have been around for a long time. Uh, for me to explain how they work in more detail and perhaps to tell you why everybody doesn't have one, We'll just divert for a second and throw a little math in here. This is the inverse square relationship between pressure and flow. What it means is uh, we have to multiply the pressure by four to double our flow. It, it's not a very efficient relationship. Um, if you need really big changes in flow, pressure is kind of a difficult way to achieve that. Thought about differently, uh, if you wanted to drop your flow by half, you only need a quarter of the pressure. So when you want to do significant changes to flow, pressure really isn't the best way to go. It's better to alter your travel speed, speed up or slow down, or even pick a different nozzle. I'll just kind of leave it hanging out there for a moment. So there are, there are three kinds of rate controllers you might consider. And just to, be, just to be bang on the money here, I've included three, even though the first one is kind of hard to find nowadays. A good rate controller, the old school one, it will monitor and adjust pressure, and it uses math to assume flow. So that'll make sense in a moment. A better controller, and a more common, will monitor and adjust flow, but really doesn't do anything with pressure. And the last one will monitor uh, pressure and it will adjust flow. So I'll explain that. The first one is the, the monitor, that the, the control monitor or rate controller that we had in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it just uses math. It's got the fewest moving, par moving parts. It's a really simple interface. Obviously, it, it would be the cheapest. And it monitors pressure, but it doesn't register flow. And what that means is, let's say you have a plug nozzle. The controller will sense back pressure. There's a, there's a, a pressure pickup in there that says, oh, uh, I'm getting more pressure off the boom. So I have to reduce pressure to compensate. I was told to keep this pressure no matter what. And uh, I assume that that means I'm going to have a certain flow. So I'll reduce the pressure. Well, unfortunately, that reduces flow along the entire boom. Your whole system pressure just drops. So not only do you not know you had a plug nozzle, 
Now all your remaining nozzles are operating at a lower pressure, which means less flow. So it becomes double jeopardy. You can see why if an operator felt that a rate controller was going to protect them in this case, uh, they could be sadly mistaken. This also shows why early rate controllers uh, didn't have the uptake that manufacturers had hoped for. Now the better and more common monitors, uh, they monitor and adjust flow, but they, they don't change pressure. So it works like this. They will alert an operator if there are changes in flow. So the operator will send, set some sort of percent error threshold, usually a little high, so that if, there's, uh, if it does some hunting, it doesn't keep beeping at you and bothering you. And the system doesn't register pressure changes. So here's an example there. Let's say flow is reduced a lot. You've, you've, you've dropped the pedal, you're moving fast, so your rate controller knows you don't need quite so much flow. If you're already operating a sprayer at a low pressure, I'm thinking ultra low volume systems, ag techs, et cetera, then head pressure or check valves at the top of the boom start to have reduced output. The pressure drops down so much that the, rate, the, um, the check valves start to close of their own accord or head pressure starts to take its toll. Usually if the sprayer is operating under 20 PSI, these ultra low volume systems, this is where this becomes a problem. And what that means is as you speed up, uh, you start to lose flow at the top of the boom in probably the hardest to hit section of the tree. So that's not good. The best rate controller monitors flow and pressure and it adjusts flow and it tells you all about it. So this gives you the best likelihood of a consistent application. There are alarms all over the place or automatic compensation that it watches flow and pressure and the user can set hard stops. So for example, if you slow down at the end of the row, you can tell it, you know what, keep my pressure and flow up. Don't, don't let it drop too low at the end of the row. I'd rather overspray a bit than miss. Uh, it gives you a low tank warning. Uh, they'll give you as applied maps, some of them. They'll store presets, so you can go from orchard to orchard and just hit a button and everything will set up the rates that you want. Uh, they cost the most. It's the steepest learning curve. Uh, you end up doing some wire wiggling because uh, the, uh, the cables are play a bigger role here. And as I say, the operators often choose to over apply at the low speeds. It's a trade-off. It ensures your trees get coverage at the end of the row. Whew, well done. You got through that and we're almost done. So. Do you need it? Um, Mark and I put this flow table together. We had some fun doing this. We'll start at the left. If you haven't changed your nozzles since 1985, you probably aren't interested in a rate controller. If your planting is more than half a hectare, it pays off. Uh, the return on investment pays off. Not just fruit quality, but uh, the potential for lower pesticide usage. Um, this is just for fun. I mean, if you start your row going full speed, if you don't slowly speed up as you start your row, you don't need a rate controller, although no one's popping their clutch. And uh, if you're on perfectly flat land, you probably don't need the rate controller. But if you've got any hills or lots of starts and stops and shorter alleys, as I say, it will pay off. So this is meant to be a little funny, but generally everybody can benefit from a rate controller. But no one likes complexity, no one likes change. And when these first came out, the support wasn't there. It may not be there now, only uh, some manufacturers have guys that have installed these on enough sprayers that they can give really good technical advice. And the really early adopters, um, they ended up buying controllers that were meant for field sprayers. They were the first ones to have it and orchardists wanted it. And what they ended up with was the wrong valve size or the wrong speed and it really didn't work, and the early adopters didn't like it, and everybody heard about it, uh, and growers have long memories. Compared to field sprayers, air assist sprayers, our horticultural sprayers travel a lot slower, they use lower flow and higher pressure, and they have a different swath. I'll get to that in a second. So rate controllers for air assist sprayers, this is a case where bigger isn't better. You want a valve that's built to handle the maximum flow that you anticipate using, because that gives you the greatest resolution. Um, I won't do this. Speed and size, basically, if your valve is too large, then a very minor change to how open or closed the valve is turns into a very large change in flow. So if you speed up and slow down a lot and the valve can't open or shut quickly enough, 
And if it opens or shuts just a little bit and the flow change is huge, then the rate controller is constantly hunting, adjusting, under adjusting, over adjusting, compensating. It can never keep up and it became super frustrating and it just didn't work well. Um, I mentioned people bought systems that were for field sprayers. They also kind of bought cheap valves. The butterfly valve on the left, it's not very precise as it starts to open. If you can imagine that valve, that circle in the center, uh, if you turn it open only a few degrees, it just cracks a bit. And then all of a sudden you turn it a few more degrees and suddenly it's half open. It, it just doesn't give the same resolution. To the right, the ball valve, if anyone's ever tried to just crack a ball valve a little bit, just moving it a few degrees from slightly open to a little more open turns into an awful lot of flow. But you can get really accurate ball valves where the, uh, the aperture is cut in such a way that it opens up evenly through the entire range of motion. And that gives the rate controller more ability for more precise change. I did mention swath. Uh, another frustration for people that bought rate controllers that weren't built for air assist sprayers is that our swath is really different from a field sprayer. A field sprayer swath is a, a two-dimensional curtain of spray, but for us, it's not. It's three-dimensional, and maybe we want to break it up into sections. We have a zone at the top and a zone at the bottom. How do you tell your rate controller to do different things for different sections? And what about if you have a multi-row sprayer? Now you've got multiple booms and multiple heads. And what you end up doing is lying and tricking the rate controller. And uh, it's awfully frustrating. I've done it and it, it's never a good experience. So let's leave rate controllers as we get to the end here and I can hand this off. We'll just say that there's a good, better and best. Best will cost you, but best will also give you a much better experience, a great return on investment. And uh, since it's designed for your sprayers, it'll, be a, it'll end up being a set it and forget it scenario. The last precision improvement is flow reflecting canopy density or target presence. This will give you a consistent rate. You'll have to bear with me on this. Here's a tree. Uh, we have no sensors. The blue is the swath of spray. If you do nothing, then as you drive along, you've got no sectional control, and one rate of flow per section. So basically you just drive and the boom's on, that's it. With the ultrasonic sensors that we started with, now the boom will turn on or off depending if there's canopy. Maybe if you're using a rate controller as well, you'll be able to do different things uh, with those two sections. Or as you speed up or slow down, you can keep that rate consistent. But the ultimate are our new LiDAR systems. These give us individual nozzle control and they don't just turn on or off, they flutter open and shut so you can change the flow depending on how much target is there. In other words, it doesn't just respond to a target being there, it changes how much flow comes out based on how much target is there. In this picture, you can see it's rather light around the edge of the target and then as the crop gets denser, there's more flow until the very center where there's the most target to cover, we have the highest flow. And, and this is happening right now uh, all over the place. On the left is a picture I took when I had the pleasure of being in Australia to visit Swarm Farm. This is an experiment that's going on there. They do robotic uh, sprayers. And this gantry it was built for prescription applications. RTKA and GPS allows them to take maps of the canopy. They just drive through the orchard with this gantry, taking photographs, billions of photographs of the canopy and turning it into a three-dimensional map. It's accurate to two and a half centimeters. On the right, this is David Mantelow's rig. Uh, he's able to zoom through his orchards, also mapping the size, shape, and density of a canopy. And the idea is that uh, they take this back to a computer, process it, and it develops a map of where the target is, how much target it is, and that's fed into the sprayer. It's pres prescription mapping. And while it's still relatively new to us in orchards, it's not new to the field croppers. They have Green Eye, which is established, uh, Tyrannus, Zarvio. These systems are so sophisticated that they can identify green on green. That is to say, they can determine not only that there's, say, a weed in a field, but which weed and what stage of development it's at, or what pest or insect it is that's on the leaf of a potato plant. They can even identify damage 
as a, a UAV flies over and takes the pictures and identifies. It's phenomenal. Now back to what they're doing at Swarm Farm, the experiment is for blossom thinning. So they drive the gantry through the RTK GPS, they capture the canopy in three heights, bottom, middle, and top. And depending on how many blooms are there, this map that you see on the left is developed. White means very few blooms, uh, the peach means medium, and the red means a lot. That information is sent to this experimental sylvan sprayer on the right. And uh, it uses direct inject to drive along and control which sections of blooms are on or off related to the map and prescription spray uh, thinner based on how much bloom is there. And uh, I don't know how far they got with this. This is about six months ago now, but they're very good with automatics and I'm pretty sure we'll hear more about this. Uh, I think I got ahead of myself. Now, what makes this possible, it's not just the ability to capture that the target is there or not, but to be able to turn the nozzles on and off. And they use something called pulse width modulation. For those not in the know, uh, this was developed in California in the 90s. Uh, Ken Giles did this. And it's been around a long time, but weirdly, it only became widespread about five years ago in North America when several companies outside of Case and Capstan started creating these things. John Deere released their exact apply two years ago, and now it's just everywhere. And here's how it works. There's your nozzle at the top. There's a, a solenoid inside. Think of it as a plunger that moves in and out. The proportion of time that that valve is open, there's spray coming out. When it's closed, there's no spray coming out. So that's called its duty cycle or pulse width. At the bottom, you can see a bar that says closed. Right now it's closed. When the plunger pulls back, it's open. So this thing flutters and pulses in and out. If you want to be on 50% of the time, you control flow by interrupting the flow 50% of the time. If you want more flow, then you're more open than shut. Now you have more flow. And what this does, is it removes that complicated equation of pressure and flow. If you remember the, uh, the equation was that if you want twice the flow, you need four times the pressure. That's done. Now we control flow just by interrupting the flow, which means we can use pressure for something different. We can use it to change droplet size. The higher the pressure, the smaller the droplet and vice versa. And we can keep our rate, our flow constant just by changing how it's interrupted. It's pretty amazing. And this is more or less where I'm going to hand this off here, because this is the final question. When someone says, okay, I'm into it. I, I like this form of precision agriculture. I like the idea of uh, putting on a rate, uh, a flow based on how much canopy is there, but what does that do with the pesticide? I got a label that says, put this much on per acre. And here I am changing my flow from moment to moment. One tree may end up getting a different volume than its tree right after it. How do we handle that? We have to think about labels and rates very differently. Um, I'm not shy to say that in North America, our labels are not written correctly for three-dimensional targets. They're simply not. And there's evidence from all over the world about this. I'm not going out on a limb by saying it. Consider this. Look at the orchard on the left, orchard one. That's a pretty big apple tree, a little bigger than semi-dwarf. Then there's orchard two and orchard three, that very young tree. If in the bottom left, we put the same amount of pesticide in our tank as we always do. That is, we keep the ratio of carrier and product the same. And then we spray that first tree and the drops land on the leaf the way they are there. We got what? Six droplets, each with the same concentration. And it took a thousand liters per hectare or a hundred gallons an acre to achieve it. We'd say that tree's well protected. That's, there it is, that's how we've always done business. Now the next tree also got the same coverage, each droplet with the same concentration, but it only took 50 gallons per acre to achieve it. Why? Well, because of precision agriculture. We didn't spray over the tree, we didn't spray under the tree, we didn't spray through it. We only applied as much as was needed, no drenches and no misses, and those efficiencies allowed us to get exactly the same coverage and give that tree the same protection, but spraying far less per acre. And in extreme cases, and I think her ping's even gone lower than this, um, if every drop counts for you, that little tree can do amazing things at 125 gallons per acre. The point is you should be able to pluck a leaf from any of these orchards and see the exact same coverage 
and have the exact same dose administered. That, that's the ultimate in precision agriculture and technology is taking us there. So um, I'll thank you and I will hang around for questions. Just that's an awful lot for anyone to digest, especially through a Zoom presentation where you can't see me waving my arms. But there are lots of resources out there that I, if you don't already know, I invite you to explore. Uh, I mentioned uh, Sprayers 101. By all means, do go search the site. It's very friendly. The search engine is, uh, is a pretty powerful. You can type any keyword in. Uh, there's resources, comic books, videos, all free. And in the bottom left, you'll see Airblast 101. That's the old edition. I hope the manuscript will be ready for layout in September, which means by Christmas, it should be available. Uh, Tom and I are both on Twitter. You're welcome to chat with us there. And with that, I'll stop sharing the screen and hand it over to Herping and Steve. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your opportunity, Mike. Just now, uh, Dr. Jason Duo gave an excellent presentation to address the principles and needs of precision sprayers for orchard applications. Jason, he is a uh, world well-known well uh, specialist expert in <clears throat> spray application technologies. He is uh, in uh, Quebec, well, he's uh, on the Rio and close to New York State and also Eastern State of USA. I'm sure he can answer any questions you may have related to pesticide spray application technologies and practices. Next, Steve and I will talk about a new laser guided intelligent precision spray system. Now we started to develop this technology actually means uh, inofficially in 2006, now, with funding uh, officially uh, in 2009, in collaboration with research and extension educators from many universities. Next slide, please. Uh, can you also start with video? Yeah. yeah, this new technology is a target-oriented spray control system. With it, the sprayers can see individual trees, measure their height, width, and foliage density, and then control each nozzle to spray the amount of chemicals to match foliage volume at a different part of each tree in real time. It reduces human involvement to make decisions on how much spray volume is needed. Thus, the complicated calibration process for conventional standard sprayers is avoided. <clears throat> the, yeah, the, uh, the intelligent spray control system is a universal retrofit for conventional sprays as shown uh, by Dr. Jason DeVos presentation previously. You saw he listed so many types of conventional sprays in orchard and special crops. Now with this, this retrofit kit, Growers themselves can upgrade their sprayers to precision sprayers rather than buy new sprayers. The control system mainly consists of a laser sensor, a computer program and algorithm, nozzle flow rate controller, a touch screen device, a travel speed sensor, and a variable flow rate valve for each nozzle. That variable rate uh, Val is what uh, Dr. DeVoe uh, talked in his, in his uh, presentation as pulse with modulated solenoid valves. And the laser sensor, yeah, please uh, turn to the next page, next slide. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, good, thanks. And this laser sensor, and it uh, has 270 degree and 90 feet uh, detection, radio detection range. It detects 43,200 points every second. Because of its high resolution, high speed and accuracy, we develop, developed an algorithm to measure foliage volume at a different part of each tree and then control each nozzle output for different parts of the tree. Spray travel speeds are also included in the spray output calculation. 
So applicators don't need to worry about how fast they drive, if you drive up here or down here. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this video shows a 500 gallon ultra sprayer in action without the spray control system. Even though trees are much smaller at the left side than right side, both sides are sprayed uh, the same. So you can see lots of spray clouds above trees and to the ground at the left side. And next slide, please. Uh, this uh, video shows the action of the same sprayer retrofitted with the intelligent spray control system. Now those automatically discharge sprays differently to two sides. Next total spray volume is discharged to smaller trees at the left side. Yeah, there are much less spray clouds beyond trees you know, compared to the previous video. Uh, this uh, the spray is, uh, is owned by Foreman Orchards in Ohio. So uh, they start to this uh, start using this spray since last year. Next slide, please. And since 2013, we have tested pest control and reliability of this new technology in commercial fields with different crops across the country. These crops include apple, peach, grape, pecan, blueberry, and raspberry. Next slide, please. A multi-year field test demonstrated that it can reduce pesticide use in a range between 30 and 85%, reduce airborne spray drift up to 87%, and reduce spray loss uh, to the ground up to 90%. Growers have reported chemical savings in a range of $56 to $812 per acre annually, depending on crop types, while their pest controls are same as effective as conventional sprayers. Because it used less spray volume per acre, it can spray more acres with the same amount of tank mixtures and reduce tank refilling times. So the smart guided systems uh, commercialized this intelligent spray technology last year. They have made significant improvements with more user-friendly functions. Now, the next, the, Steve, the founder and CEO of the company will give details on the commercial product. Steve, I turn to you. Thank you, Dr. Zhu. I'll uh, kind of go kind of quick through my presentation, um, keeping track of time. And one of the videos um, was kind of a summary of what Dr. Zhu had presented on, so I'll uh, just pass through that instead. Um, a little history about our company and me. Um, it helps tie the whole story together why we were selected by the USDA to commercialize the system. But my last company uh, was Productive Resources. We got up to a, a staff of 160 engineering people on staff and we had four locations around the US. And we did outsource engineering work for large companies. So all the companies below uh, Rolls-Royce, DRS Technology, Navistar, John Deere, we're all customers that we served um, projects and did design work for. One of the projects we did for John Deere um, won the, the 2009 Ag Product of the Year. And it was at that point that I said, when I sell this business, I'm going to start designing my own products instead of designing products for other companies. And then they get the awards and, and make the money. Somebody warned me it does take a lot more time and money and energy to start your own. Uh, product and get it going, which is absolutely the truth. Um, our first product was uh, auto steer using a, a wireless Android based system for Kubota Tractor Corporation. We signed an agreement with Kubota, introduced uh, a system for grounds maintenance and horticulture um, with auto steer. 
uh, had a lot of features that were meant for their markets, which is orchards, um, airports, mowing, um, but uh, was a great system. Um, Kubota being a great company, uh, there are Japanese and it, it, they were moving at a slow pace. So uh, we, we kind of separated ourselves from that agreement over time. Uh, but we did get a patent on that system as it was developed. Uh, then in, in 2018, we developed a precision spray system for golf course sprayers and signed a contract, I think, for 540 of those systems with, with a, a large public company. Uh, on the market today, it's a great system, all Android-based, and, and that's sold uh, to golf courses. Uh, but that did get the intention of the USDA. Uh, they made a visit with Ohio State and uh, said, you ought to come look at our system. And when we saw the intelligent um, spray system, we said that's really where we need to focus our attention. And that's what we've done. This video, as I mentioned, is really a summary of what Dr. Zhu has done. So I think I'll go ahead and pass over that. It is uh, on our website, smartapply.com, uh, if you want to go see it, but it's pretty much what Dr. Zhu uh, presented on. Um, as Dr. Zhu mentioned, uh, there's 47 published peer-reviewed, uh, scientific peer-reviewed journals that conclude uh, 47 to 73% reduction in spray consumption, 40 to 87% reduction of spray loss beyond tree canopies, up to 87% less airborne drift, 68 to 93 reduction in spray loss in the ground uh, with equal or better crop protection. And then as Dr. Zhu mentioned, uh, the different areas that they have researched in, we have since now have, have put them in uh, citrus. Uh, we've got them in um, almonds as well, which was not part of the original research. A couple of quotes I, I threw in. Cherry Lake Nursery is the third largest nursery uh, in the U.S. Um, they're saving 57%. Uh, they have three of our systems, and that's all the sprayers they have. Uh, King Ranch Consolidated Citrus, they're saving 37% above their current sonar system, and their sonar system is reported to save about 20%. So we're again around 57%. In, in citrus in Florida. In apples in Washington State, we're around uh, an average of 37%, and that's when it's all full canopy and their V-trail systems. In pears, we're anywhere between 40 and 60% based on the time of year, and that's in Oregon. Uh, so we do have systems all over the U.S. Um, Taking what Dr. Zhu had in the USDA, um, a lot of, as you would see in a, you know, that setting, a lot of hand-wired uh, put together systems. Uh, we did definitely uh, industrialize and commercialize it. We use now a sick LIDAR, it's made in Germany. It scans at 120,000 points per second. Uh, it's IP67, which is outdoor rated. We've also now added a fan shroud uh, to blow filtered air over that LIDAR if you're in dusty conditions. Uh, GPS for speed, uh, Novotel is the number one producer of GPS for ag. Uh, they're built up in Canada. Uh, we see an average of 23 to 27 satellites. So there's very few times where we don't get accurate speed, even in heavy tree coverage. On the controllers, we uh, wrote the spec for the controllers and developed those. Uh, they're produced up in Michigan by an automotive supplier. Uh, one controller can do 13 nozzles. If you need to do uh, more than that, which most air blast sprayers are, we can daisy chain those together for a total up to 39 nozzles if we ever need to go that many. And that's IP67 rated. The tablet is included in the system. It, it's uh, an Android tablet by Samsung. We've actually upgraded now to a, a ruggedized commercial outdoor tablet and it, it's a it's a very high-end tablets included with the system. The algorithms, um, they were all written in C++, and we actually wrote a new design spec for that code and rewrote all that code, and you, we use Ant, uh, Java for Android, so it's a very efficient code. It's on Google Play. Um, you can download it. You can't do anything with it unless you have the system, obviously. Uh, the solenoids, 
Uh, we use T-Jet solenoids currently. We are in development with a supplier of our own uh, design, and it will be one that will have its ability to flush and, and keep clean and with very little water, and so you can flush out the system very easily. Um, the type of chemicals used in this market versus ag uh, is it, pretty tough on the solenoids if they're not flushed often, but there's a lot of growers that don't flush your systems often, and uh, we've found that we really need to be able to do that on the fly, so we'll have a, a, a purge and flush option on the tablet. The Wi-Fi router, um, actually just eliminated that. Uh, we started shipping the new ruggedized tablet. It wasn't available before, but the LiDAR, we can plug the LiDAR uh, cable directly into uh, the tablet so it eliminates having the Wi-Fi router. Before the, the Wi-Fi router would take the LiDAR data, talk to the, uh, the tablet via Wi-Fi, and we would process and send commands back to the uh, controller via Bluetooth. And we still use Bluetooth to send the commands. Uh, here's a quick video. I've got to pop out and go to YouTube, um, but this is uh, some new advanced features that we have added uh, to the system. Hopefully everybody can see. Um, I'm going to walk through what the video is actually saying because the sound wasn't good when we tested. Uh, so we're, we're offering advanced uh, crop protection and, and documentation now. We also then um, go up to the John Deere Operations Center uh, there's a live view as you spray. It says you, as you spray, you can see exactly where you are using Google Map overlays. In the upper right-hand corner there, you can actually see where we're counting trees as we go. Uh, we report gallons per acre by defined boundary, so you can either draw or, or you can drive a boundary. And once you do that, you spray, it converts it back to gallons per acre. Uh, you can generate a, a coverage report that's pushed to the cloud when you sink. Uh, we use Azure. We have servers all over the world now uh, that we're able to, to go to. Um, tree reporting, uh, we look at average tree height, tree width, and then we can tell you the average tree count uh, of your orchard. We can also then uh, tell you how many gallons average based on the tree height. Uh, we determine location of trees. Um, there's a database, so you can go in and say, hey, I want to go and and find all the trees that are 36 inches tall, for example, or only trees that are you know, 48 inches tall or so wide and, and search those trees and identify those. Uh, that's also good for identifying vines and vineyards that may be missing. There again, all that data is push, pushed up to uh, Azure. Uh, we do crop density heat maps. So based on uh, the amount of spray, but more red is more dense, so we know that there's more density there, very similar to the earlier you slide, the slide that you saw with uh, using cameras. Now these density maps can be overlaid and, and compared um, between sprays or uh, between years. So as an example, if you sprayed you know, December 1, or not December 1, but June 1 one year and June around June 1 the second year, you would be able to compare that density and, and see what it was the prior year. If you're tracking the number of crates or bins per uh, uh, track or area, um, you can look at that density point count and, and do yield estimates based on that. If you're able to go down to even uh, individual rows, um, you could track density per row and what that yield would be um, per row based on historic density. Uh, we were at 95, 97.5% uh, accuracy on the trees. Um, and we were counting trees at a, approximately eight and a half mile per hour. We, we were in a pickup truck doing it. And we know if you spray it two and a half, three mile an hour, um, the accuracy of tree count would be even greater. Uh, we can zoom in and, and see how many ounces of chemicals per tree. Every time you spray, um, tells you uh, what was sprayed, wind conditions, and uh, you can actually zoom in per tree. Um, getting ready to release target spray. So you could do boundaries where you want to spray or where you don't want to spray. You can create those boundaries either drawn on the tablet 
or you can do it by by driving your boundary. So if say you have a, a newer track, you want to make sure nobody ever sprays, you can drive. If you've got young trees where you don't want sprayed because of the chemical or application you're using or fertilizer, um, you could mark those as no spray. And then the same is true um, if you want to spray everything, um, only the boundaries that you select or no spray. Um, so you can toggle between the two and that's based on filters that you can select. And then for those that use John Deere, uh, we did sync with the John Deere's operations center. And, and that's a plus for, uh, for large growers that do use that telematics and some of those features that, that John Deere has available. Um, system return on investment, the base system price is 27,000. That's for up to 24 nozzles. The, uh, the fan blower, I believe is $1,100. Um, and the estimated ROI, is numbers we got from the extension offices, but but we've learned it depends on what area of the country you're in. You know those numbers great uh, are greatly different. Apples in Washington State are about $1,200 per acre, and other places are not. Uh, oranges in Florida are around uh, $600 an acre. But it gives you an idea of what your return is. Uh, what I recommend is that you go to SmartApply.com and Savings Calculator. And, and put your own numbers in. And then I would you know, turn that down to what's the minimum I need to get a return you know, in a year or whatever it might be as a 20% savings or a 30% savings to get a, a good return. A few screenshots of the app. Um, when you're logged on, that's the main screen. Uh, it's pretty simple. You got spray support and settings. Uh, under support, we're able to do a help ticket system. So say your system goes down, we can actually have you do a, a help ticket from the tablet. It pulls one hour of, of data from the GPS, the nozzles, the, uh, the electrical system, the GPS, everything. And we can generally troubleshoot the system just with a help ticket. Um, spray configuration, um, pretty simple setup, but it, it, it's how far is your, your, uh, your, your LIDAR from your spray nozzles. Um, what's the measurements so of your spacing on your nozzle, nozzles and, and things like that, that that really dialed in. And then we have the actual nozzle settings. So we you tell it what the flow ounces uh, per cubic foot and it, it's tied back to the nozzles that you're using. Um, and how we configure this in the field is we'll have a grower go out and spray without our system on. We put water in, in the tank. Uh, we put water sensitive strips in the trees and we have the grower spray and we say are you happy with coverage and and generally it's yes and then we take those those strips we take our system and put strips in the same area and we really start low so we want to start way down of ounces per cubic foot and work our way up but that shows the grower how precision this system is and you can see the droplets increasing as we increase that number and when we get to a level, the grower says, okay, I'm happy with that in the most dense part of the tree. That's how we configure and set that as the, um, the, the rate that we want for the most dense part of the tree. Then when you get a tree with half the density, it's gonna put on half the amount of chemical. We also have where you can do multiple configurations. Uh, we've learned that every row spacing could be different on the same farm. Um, some could be 18 foot, some could be 16, and your, your rate's going to be different. Um, we've got it set up now, so if there's a boundary for that area, you, you drive into that boundary, it automatically pulls the configuration file it needs for that boundary, and then it sprays um, based on that configuration. Um, there's a foot pedal that activates the system, so the operator doesn't have to do anything as far as knowing how to configure, how to set up the system or anything. It's, one thing we learned is the growers got a little scared of all the things that you can do with it, but it can be very simple for the, the low end operator. There's a screenshot of what you can see while you're spraying. Our test vehicle here that we spray with has 17 nozzles per side. Uh, we do have delay settings on here where if the wind's blowing slightly, you can uh, have the system start a little sooner or a little bit later. We have a manual mile per hour. Uh, there was one case we were in heavy almonds in California, 
and the GPS was, was getting knocked off for one, but we're having trouble uh, getting speed. So we hit a manual speed of a two and a half mile an hour. And that's the speed that consists of um, spray in. Now we do have the option as well for a, a ground um, sensor, but uh, if they get dirty and uh, it was mentioned the, the tall um, grass, it does throw it off a little bit. Our system tells you when it's connected, so it's green. If for any reason the LiDAR starts to get dirty, it'll pop up and say uh, LiDAR is getting dirty. If it gets to a point where uh, the LiDAR can't see, the whole screen turns red and says, I'm not going to spray anymore. Um, we also have a feature on the, the sprayer uh, for overrides. So say you get you know out to your tractor, your tank's full, you're ready to go spray. It's you know five in the morning and you forgot your tablet or you didn't charge the tablet, you don't have your cord. You can go back and, and push the override button. It opens the solenoids up. Um, you use your, your sprayer like you always did before. So you never have to worry about losing a tank uh, or not having you know the system going uh, for any reason, or if you snag wires. We do have the ability to identify a wire connection problems to the solenoids. Uh, the, the, the little green icon there will turn uh, red saying there's a problem. Uh, you can gray out certain nozzles, say so you don't want to use the top five nozzles, you just push and hold, um, the, the nozzles will be turned off so you don't have to use those. Those also can be set up for a different configuration. So say you want to spray a certain um, growth inhibitor, but only the top part of the, the tree, um, you can say, hey, I just want the top four nozzles on and nothing else. So that's, that's why we did that. A uh, map view was in the video, but it just shows you, uh, you know, where you're spraying. Um, if you run out halfway through a row, uh, you, you turn, hit the switch, turn ours off, it'll tell you where you stopped. You go back and you can start spraying where you lost, um, or stop spraying the previous time. Uh, it's designed to be work anywhere in the world. So we got a language file that we pull from. So uh, any language can be used. And if there's a language that, you know, any grower would want, it takes us about 48 hours to add that language. Um, we use uh, WAS for our, our tree count. We're able to, to get an idea of where that tree is and, and we can geo-reference that tree and snap back to that tree without using uh, unlocking that system. But we do use TerraStar uh, and we can unlock the antenna remotely. There's a, there's a subscription for that. But we can get the two and a half centimeter accuracy using satellite correction so you don't need to have a cell and you don't need to have rtk network uh, that's one thing we learned on kubota was some of their customers are very remote and they had to work anywhere in the world so we can unlock that uh, antenna anywhere in the world uh, we have filed for patent um, 31 claims total uh, three independent claims and we're getting ready to file for two additional patents. One will be on the way we're gonna do the solenoid and another uh, is a sprayer related patent that we've learned since being out in the field on this. Uh, we have won a few awards. Uh, ASAB 50, uh, AE 50 award is an award that's selected by the association and companies all over the world um, get selected for that award. The World Eye Expo uh, 2020, we won the top 10 new product of the year. And then um, at the top 50 AE awards, um, ASABE picks um, the, the top three. And it's voted on by the members, and we were fortunate to get uh, voted as one of the top three products of the year. So that definitely helped get us uh, going in a, in a good way. Currently, we have uh, 44 installations that are either installed now or scheduled. Uh, majority of those are installed. Um, we've been hurt slightly by the the, uh, the boundaries and not be able to get out of the country. Uh, we're using Zoom uh, to, to accomplish that currently. Uh, we have four dealers, and if you look at the number of locations those dealers have, it represents 104 total locations. And we actually just signed another John Deere dealer today that has, I believe, 15 or, or so locations. We are shipping the international. We have a distributor um, signed uh, for Peru and Chile. We have one, a manufacturer of sprayers and uh, controls really Indian market for sprayers uh, in India. And we have uh, a John Deere dealer 
as a distributor a dealer in, in Australia and also a, a manufacturer of sprayers signed and then in New Zealand. Um, we were able to do Zoom meetings and get the international ones up and running. India is still on shutdown, unfortunately, so they, they can't get their system out of uh, shipping. Uh, people ask, well, what are you going to do next? Uh, next, we're working on a variable rate targeted liquid fertilizing. Um, so, you know, right now, you know, you set your rate to be average for that orchard, but if you got a four foot tree, an eight foot tree, uh, we'll be able to target those. And we'll use historic data so you don't have to have a LIDAR. So we'll be able to go back and, and fertilize based on um, the tree count and size that we took previously. Uh, chemical bloom thinning, um, we'll be doing that in Washington and also in pear trees um, in Oregon and Washington. And they're again based on density in spring and, and real time. And then vineyard pruning, I would have never thought that uh, I'd be asked to do vineyard pruning, but apparently it's a, it's a big problem in, in large operations that we would use LIDAR data to, uh, to guide the pruners so the operators uh, could get more than one row at a time and, and be more accurate. So that's, uh, that's all I have. All right, great, thank you, Steve. So now we're gonna answer the questions that have been coming in. We do have a couple in the chat box here, or the Q&A box, rather. Uh, so we do have a question when you use the smart guidance systems, how do you maintain records on a per acre basis? Steve, you're on mute again. We, we do it by boundary. So if, if you want to do it by, so what we do is with the boundary, we will do a boundary around the whole track and we average the gallons per acre for reporting. Um, if, if you want to see, you know, per acre, you'd have to do a boundary. Um, per acre to get the actual gallons per acre for each acre indep independently. Are there any units being used or demonstrated in New York currently, or do you have future plans to? Uh, we'd love to demo a unit in New York. Uh, the closest one right now is Penn State and, and Michigan, which isn't real close. Um, but we, we, you know, we are looking for opportunities to, uh, to do systems. I, yeah, I didn't want to make this a sales pitch at all um, because that's not the way I sell, but we do have a 90 day demo agreement uh, where you put a deposit down and we install and train for free. But uh, we learned it takes 90 days to really understand the system and validate it. All right, great. Can the system work with multi-row sprayer systems? Uh, yes, currently we're using uh, a nursery. I know we're doing two rows. So you know, the LIDAR, a good example of LIDAR is when you walk through the woods and you see the sunlight rays coming down through the trees, that's what the LIDAR sees. So it, it's kind of going through the, 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 the tree and, and built uh, you know, a density map based on that. Um, uh, and, and Dr. Zoo might be better. And, and Vineyard, a good, good example is you know, we're looking at three rows at a time, but we're assuming those row, the density on those rows is, is equal on both sides. So we activate both sides of that, those nozzles as if it's, it's one sprayer, um, but we're using density from one side of the, the LIDAR, picking that up and not using multiple LIDARs. Yes, that a laser sensor can detect a 90 feet away uh, from from the sensor, so that means if you have multi rows and they plan to a lot same line, so you can spray multi rows. And in ornamental nurseries, we always spray three rows or even four rows at a time. Yeah, and and, and this slider actually goes one hundred and it goes fifty meters, one hundred and sixty feet. Yeah. Okay, so it can work on a, you know, a, a, an over the row type of multi sprayer where you're hitting multiple rows at the same time. For that kind of design, we can uh, also uh, add uh, multi systems, probably have uh, two or three uh, sensors on top of the, the sprayer and then can still can provide same function. Yeah. Okay, great.
We got a question from Motugas. Uh, one of our biggest challenges in obtaining adequate uniform coverage has to do with the effects from wind. While air dams can be manually controlled in the cab, attempting to do so can easily result in driving into trees. Would sensors detecting wind speed, direction, and direction of travel be useful? Sensors being linked to the air dams. Yeah, this uh, technology hand uh, include the wind speed or wind effects on the, in the design. So, uh, but this one can, because it can reduce not uh, spray airborne spray drift beyond uh, the trees, you can actually spray uh, under the higher wind speed. For example, like in orchard, usually we don't recommend you to spray at uh, eight miles per hour wind speed. So that's, but with this spray, you can spray even higher than eight miles per hour, maybe 15 miles per hour or 20 miles per hour. We don't know yet. We need more study in the future to determine that threshold. We, we have chosen the company not, not to start trying to, to get local wind data um, it, it gets very complex, as I'm sure uh, you guys know more than I do about that. But right now, we have chose to, to do the millisecond delay to help if there is a, a small wind. All right. This system, this system, I, I think it should be said that any operator is still responsible for recognizing conditions they need to spray in and adjusting the sprayer to give them the best coverage possible, this system will detect whether there's a target and it'll release a, a volume that it expects to give that coverage, but it doesn't release the operator from occasionally checking to see if the spray is going where they think it's going and using water sensitive paper and, and using good judgment. It, it won't make all those decisions for you. You're exactly right. You, yeah, Dr. Jason, no, those. So you, you, you see, is that exactly right? I mean, you, you have to keep your own um, best practice. And uh, the spray coverage and quality will be the same as uh, what you had before, because they don't change the spray deposition quality uh, per tree as what you had with standard spray application. And they only uh, shut off the sprays when there are gaps and uh, or they spray less when there are uh, not many leaves, but and uh, that's, that's the best practice still uh, by operators. Sure. What is the lowest uh, gallons per acre or, or gallons per minute that the system can operate at? Uh, the grower sets the rate. All we do is is apply based on density the rate that you've set. Yeah, and also, like, you know, we also test that system in Ohio for spray thermal oil you know, in the earlier spring season. At that time, not many leaves on you know, trees. They even goes down to about 10 gallons per acre for ornamental nurseries. For Ping, years ago, you did some work in your lab in Ohio State where you built artificial canopies and tried to get a sense of how much volume is required to cover a cubic foot or a cubic meter of dense canopy. I mean, you, you do operate within certain limitations. We know there's only so much a droplet can do for us. If you've only got five droplets, they're, they're not gonna cover a ton of area. So where's the cutoff on your system? Where will it say, no, that's just not enough? Is, is it capable of doing that? Uh, yeah, so we, uh, we developed the program called Deposit Scan to analyze spread deposition quantity on water sensitive papers. And we did many experiments. We think usually the, the spray coverage is about 30%. That means you have adequate spray coverage. Or you have like 50 to 70 droplets per square centimeter, that translates for about 150 you know, droplets to 200 droplets per square uh, inch. I mean, you have uh, sufficient uh, 
spray coverage for your uh, for your deposition. And that, that's just what you said before growers, you still need to use water sensitive paper to determine uh, the, the spray uh, deposition quantity. But right now with the new uh, uh, spray system, we use like a, a spray volume per tree spray volume to achieve that spray uh, deposition quantity. So for example, you know, like apple trees, we said point when uh, ounce uh, of spray liquid per cubic square uh, feet of canopy volume. So if you can use that, uh, uh, the, the, rate, uh, the rate, you will get uh, sufficient spray coverage for apple uh, trees. So that means point one ounce per, uh, point one ounce of spray volume per uh, one cubic feet of canopy volume. Use that one. Okay, great. So yeah, and also that uh, rate you can uh, input into uh, the intelligent spray system. And now, now use tablet, tablet, and then you that's on the uh, touch screen. So you input that rate to touch screen. You can uh, uh, define by yourself. And now that you guys have as applied maps, and you can tie this to yield, the question of was that enough is answered. You you see the fruit quality, you see the yield, you have the evidence that it works. It, I mean, that's a confidence we didn't have before when we talked about how much is enough and what does good coverage look like. You've got a few years now where you can look back over the numbers and see if, did I push it too far? Did I get what I thought I was getting? Your confidence, obviously, working with Steve the way you have and rolling this out, you're there. Your nursery yeah. numbers used to terrify people. Half rates, oh my goodness. Yeah. And that's one reason why it, it takes growers a lot of time. And King Ranch is a, the biggest grower almost in Florida. And they probably tested for nine months, you know, just about a whole season uh, before they purchased. And, and you know, that'll, that'll shorten it as the other growers hear about it. And hopefully as we go down to South America, we won't have to do that again. But every crop seems like they really want to take it through the test. And then once they say, hey, it does, then they, you know, they buy more systems and tell all their friends, but it is a slow process. Well, we still have a few years to go too with concerns of sublethal doses and resistance. I mean, I'm, I'm actually preaching against myself here because I've always been an advocate for this level of precision, but uh, I've never taken it as far as you guys have. And it, it even gives me pause with lowest efficacious rates being registered and, and the risks of certain fungicides creating resistance. I'm ultimately, I think the best system, and, and you'll probably end up there first, is uh, some of these digital water sensitive papers that I've seen out of California and Australia, and I think even in New York, Andrew Landers was working on a, a digital apple, where as the sprayer passed, you got real time coverage data, and it closed the loop. Your sprayer thinks it was doing X, and the tree received Y. And then you yeah. need boots on the ground to determine, oh, yeah, Y is enough, we have efficacy. Until we get that last technology, the tie-in for your sprayer, I mean, that's when this really starts to fly. When are you going to sell that apple, that magic water-sensitive paper for us that ties into the system? Are you working on that, Herping? Yeah, we are thinking about uh, that uh, method too. But right now, just the accuracy is not very high because you have a lot of overlaps of droplets on the electron. Uh, Electric circuit board, so that uh, accuracy is not that great. That's your thirty percent. Once you get to thirty percent coverage, there's too many overlaps to make Correct. sense. Anymore. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I see there's there's no more open questions. So if anybody does still have questions, I'll please continue typing them in. Uh, at this point, you know, I also welcome you to to go ahead and and raise your hand if you want to ask questions live. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, thank you all for joining us. We're going to keep recording if anybody does have any more questions coming in. Um, but yeah, if, if you have any more questions, please uh, keep typing or, or raise your hand and we'll, we'll get you answered. Somebody's right, raising I, their hand. Yep. I do see we have a, at least one here. So I'm going to go ahead and 
Let's see if we can't add add Pete here. Am I on? Yep, we can hear you, Pete. So I'm interested in reducing the volume of what I do. It's nice to have it precision located in a certain place, but I'm now interested in the droplet size. If, if we're uncomfortable with the volume of material that's, or that's 50 gallons or 150 gallons per acre, uh, what is the role of the droplet size? Oh, the droplet size will not change because the uh, spray will still use your original nozzles and use your uh, uh, original suit. They just um, change the flow rate by pulse width modulated the sound valves as Dr. Uh, Devo, Jason Devo indicated in his previous uh, presentation. So the job size will not be changed. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or if you guys have more questions later, you can send us email. So you know, we can also an can answer your you know, questions through email or phone calls. So I always receive a lot of emails and phone calls from different growers about this technology. Okay. Sure. And I'm not seeing any more raised hands or any more open questions. And I know we are we are quite over at this point. So I think at, at this point, unless there's you know a final question or two, you know, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I'd like to thank our, our speakers. You know, thank you all for, for joining us and uh, giving us this really great informative talk today. And uh, thank everyone again for coming. And again, we'll, we'll have this posted up in the next few days. So it'll be up on our Eastern New York YouTube page in, uh, in the next couple of days. Great, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, thank, Steve. You for thank, thank you, Michael. Yeah. Thank you again. Yeah. I'll see you all. Stay safe. You too. <laughs> Bye.